Yeah, a weird relationship with home. Just because it was so spread people. out? It was just never like one place where all the memory was made, you know what I mean? Yeah. Mostly because of kind of our connection with family. Yeah. Like me and my sister were super divided when we were young. It's so cool to have her out here now and like doing shit together and be on the same program. But me and her were super divided. It's because of what was going on with our parents. Like we didn't get a lot of info on like when they had their divorce and uh, when they did broke off, I was like really, really abusive. And obviously yeah. when you're a kid and you don't have a lot of information or like proper uh, counseling, like through what's going on. Cause you just don't yeah. understand. Yeah. Totally. Instantly you assume it's your fault when you're a kid, like you're causing these arguments. Oh, of course. You're the, you're the stressor and the, yeah. um, you know, the kind of catalyst to what's going on is that, yeah. is that you're here and you're tough to take care of. Yeah. And like when you're like seven years old, you're kind of just like easily brought into admission of that, like kind of easy to take that stance and, is that when your parents got a divorce, when you were about seven or so? I guess they, they didn't get a divorce till seven years of suing each other later. Oh, shit. <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah when, they were, like, when I was six years old, my dad took off back to Quebec and yeah. didn't hear anything back. Have you heard from him since? Or? Like two or three times, but um, that's another weird thing about how oblivious you are when you're young is that yeah. I had no idea my dad was like a drug addict and how much he drank. Like, I, I know yeah. now from like visits and like short uh, catch ups, but my dad would go through a two six and a twenty four case in a day. But it's just all you'd seen, so you probably didn't think much of it as a kid. I had never even noticed, let alone how much blow or whatever he's doing yeah. during a normal day. Wow, it's crazy to like you're so oblivious to that when you're young. Like I know a yeah. lot of kids with alcoholic parents, they just they just remember the arguments and nothing to do with what led up or yeah. actually any reasoning behind it. Did you have moments afterwards where it would click and be like, oh, that's what was happening. Like that was Coke and that was like the drinking and that was that. I didn't really relate it exactly to that. Yeah. But I more related it to the history of how he grew up. Yeah. Like it was a tough thing uh, on my, my dad's side of the family is that they actually experienced this all through their father. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. It was why it was brought along. Um, but the rest of his sisters... Uh, He's got a decent sized family as well with two other uh, two other sisters. Okay. And the rest of them are it's almost like they're so like terrified by it that it's just been tossed behind them. To the point where they won't talk about it. Like yeah. Like my dad's still undergoing these issues from it. It's obviously a reflection of what uh, not being able to deal with what happened and uh they like don't want to talk about it, wanna pretend like it's not happening kind of thing. Yeah. Um, even with the way like my dad still acts and whatnot, they're kind of just like, oh, it's totally normal. And they just put it to the wayside, don't want to talk about it. Yeah, it's crazy, crazy actually thing to kind of observe. Yeah. But, um, their father, um, Mac, I've only seen like one photo. Might be the reason why I'm tall because he was like 6'3 or something. But yeah. from what I know in like our whole family lineage, well, we don't really have one to an extent. So also a really trippy fact about me is that both my parents are adopted. Okay. So we have oh, wow. no idea where the fuck any of us are from. And around the age, um, I was actually told to read a really good book recently I should get on, but yeah. um, around the age where um, they would have been adopted, yeah. there was massive uh, change in law to how, how much you can legally pursue your parents. Oh, okay. At the time... Um, when you were to put your kid up for adoption, you weren't allowed. Now, like nowadays you can leave an option of yeah. whether you'd like your kids to be able to pursue your identity one day due to their choice yeah, or whether you'd like to be anonymous kind of thing. Right. Uh, and back then you had no choice as to when you gave up your kids, you were anonymous. Yeah. No information, no paper trail. Like, right. That you, you walked away completely. Yeah. A really crazy thing to think of because my mom, I think she's actually attempted to find, to find her birth parents and yeah. it has been totally unsuccessful. Yeah, because at that time, yeah, no records, no nothing. Yeah. So you don't know anything past your Yeah, which is why I need to do one of those fucking DNA tests. We're so yeah. gifted nowadays with where we can actually go. All well, I have to do is spit in a tube and send it away. 200 bucks, that's and, it. Yeah, find out from there. I yeah. didn't know it was that much. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, I know. There, uh, I looked it up and was like, oh, it's more expensive than I thought. But still, even then for- That's the same one for 23 and me? Yeah, yeah. yeah they like, well, they have like two. One's like, one's like 200 bucks, one's like 300 bucks. We give it the extra hundred bucks. <laughs> I think it's like more, more searching. They like look into your shit more. I guess. I think it's more to do with like 
nutrition and like in risk factors for your health and stuff like that but you still get your lineage for the cheap one that's stuff's almost more important yeah because with where we're going with gene development and uh actually being able to change a bit of our physiology especially through our our children and yeah. we've noticed that some of those genes are actually passed along. Yeah. And you could find out through a DNA test as simple as that, that maybe your whole family has been prone to cancer at four yeah. years old. Predisposed. Or, yeah. yeah. Predisposed disease. Um, yeah. It doesn't go just with like medical disease. It goes a lot further into the type of person you might even be like, yeah. Um, personality characteristics and mm-hmm. who you might be predisposed to be as a person. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or actually what you're predisposed to like. Um, sports, uh, things like your height, your weight, yeah. your muscle building, the ca- characteristics. You know yeah. what I mean? Like your, um, what's the right word for it? Availability oh, to like be a, physiology an athlete something. or whatever. Yeah, totally. Like there is so much that we uh, accredit to discipline nowadays that's almost it's taken like, away from that fact that yeah. I can't be Shaquille O'Neal. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, well, that's that whole nature versus nurture argument, whether or not you're born and then like bred to be a certain way or that you, you know, make the choice and your environmental factors make a difference on it. To say it's 50 50. <laughs> yeah, I think it can go either way. Because there's a lot of people who went through the same tough childhoods and some of them turned out fucking great. And some of them didn't. Yeah. Some of them went down the rabbit hole. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's easy to do. But we are products of our environment. Yeah. Inside. Yeah, it's proven factor, which is interesting. Yeah. Do you think about that much? Like with seeing, uh, you know, like how your dad's life went and then you look into yeah. yours. Yeah. It's probably been the biggest, uh, biggest factor on how I choose to wake up in the morning every day. Yeah. It's a crazy thing, actually, that I think about a lot, um, yeah. especially with my first girlfriend uh-huh. and the way the way I want to treat people and the way. Yeah. Uh, the way I would be as a parent, obviously. Yeah. To change that aspect of things. Looking down the line. Um, I think it, yeah, like you said, it either, some people, you know, they get in that environment and they choose to go down the rabbit hole, they choose not to. Like you see a lot of people in those abusive situations do the same thing to the next person, like do it to their kids and their kids do it to the next kids until someone kind of breaks the chain. I think it's a lot about momentum as well. Yeah. It's who we are, we're, we follow momentum. Like yeah. it's so hard to get in and out even on a, a good day or a bad day, whether yeah. it's good momentum, it's yeah, easy to keep it going. Yeah, having a good day, you're making your workouts, you're getting to work, you're getting good. That's when good it's response. easy to do it. Yeah, things are easy. You keep that momentum going, and when momentum is bad, you're you're not making it, and you're having arguments. Yeah. Um, in your relationship, in your life, yeah. it's it's easier to keep that going than it is to try and turn around and stop what's going on. Yeah. 100%. You're fighting with your girlfriend. It's easier to just say, fuck you. I'm going to bed than it is to sit there, make a connection with someone and try and figure things out. You know what I mean? Yeah. You choose the harder path for the greater good kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot easier to just keep your momentum going in that direction and follow the negativity. This is probably the biggest thing I learned in high school is I had, was lucky enough to have some really, uh, kind of, uh, intelligent teachers in the way that yeah. they understood my circumstance and okay. they're lucky enough to have someone be harsh enough with me that I needed to be like yeah tell me things like I was very prone to pitying myself okay when I couldn't say I wouldn't make an assignment because I was working after school I'd be I'd leave school at 3 30 and I'd get to work for four so I'd ride my longboard right from yeah uh, in the case it was English class every Thursday I'd ride right from English class to to my restaurant and I'd get there at four, usually 10 minutes late, take some shit for that because yeah. I was leaving school yeah. and I had to do something after school or whatever it was and start yeah. there and then get back in the next day and why didn't you do your assignment? Well, I finished work at 1 a.m. last night. Yeah. When was I supposed to do my assignment? And you don't get anything from that. No. Like it's, it's easy to make excuses and feel bad for yourself, but right. who's really losing? Yeah. When you finish English 12 and all you've done is no assignments. Right who's winning or losing <laughs> yeah kind of saying like the situation in that sense as much as it has a big effect it the outcome is what matters more so you kind of just have to figure so, figure out a way to get there yeah i think the people who are willing to uh you know tell you the shit you don't want to hear the most valuable like for sure yeah my english 12 teacher was a great role model um kind of mentored you a bit and was actually one of the least liked people in our entire school really <laughs> yeah was it for being a very aggressive um teaching style yeah and 
um, being an English teacher, they have a very harsh perspective on how you speak. It's yeah, a very totally. tough thing to hear that you don't know how to speak English. <laughs> yeah, you're like, I've been doing this my entire life. Yeah. What are you talking about? And it, in a harsh way that you don't receive from a lot of high school teachers that yeah. you're bad at this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a harsh reality that you don't receive until you meet college. But when you're getting in grade 12, what's better than a transitionary period? Like, do you want to arrive in college? And then the thing you, she also used to say is take advantage of this last year. Yeah. This is the last time anyone actually gives a fuck about you. Yeah, that's willing to take the time. Once you once you leave high school, no one's tracking you down to make sure your assignment's put in. True. No one's making sure you get to class even. Yeah. Mom's probably not there to make sure you're up for class. Yeah. If you don't make it, I don't give a fuck either. You already paid. Yeah. Like you right. lose that uh, that level of care and uh, surrounding network of people as well who actually it matters you know like once you leave that environment in high school yeah. first of all your teacher your teacher cares you don't make it to class you don't make it to too many classes you're all of a sudden there with your vice principal yeah he cares if you don't make it to class someone else you're going to be going to school counseling like we don't have that surrounding support network yeah just in normal well, day of life right yeah like yeah you don't go to the gym no one cares you don't go to work no one cares like they just fire you, you yeah just get, yeah you're sol at that and point. then you're stuck at home yeah there's no counselor showing up to your door to say hey how's how's things going yeah totally. <laughs> like, that's up to you to figure it out and get up tomorrow and make <laughs> a better day can you um like track back some changes like that you made during that year that you think you apply these days like as far as like getting those things done that otherwise you would have you know blown off to circumstance that you kind of you think you just took more accountability oh, sure. at that time and that accountability has kind of just gone through into your day-to-day -day these days for sure is that was kind of the realization time of yeah we all were so excited to finish high school yeah and uh not to the point where a lot of us are excited to stop learning yeah whereas the biggest thing we should have been taught in high school is that when we graduate we have all the tools to continue learning and learning things yeah on our own and uh, by the time i graduated i went through that for about a uh, a couple of weeks thinking of what I'm going to do next. I had no yeah. money for post-secondary um, and had no aspirations for anything that I exactly wanted to do. So I was right. in school for construction at the time because I knew I could make a good buck yeah, yeah. after high school. And two months go by and it wasn't for me. <laughs> yeah, dude. It's a it came life. out and then yeah. it, it ch changed my mind to, um, I had booked a flight to Australia actually. Okay. And then I got the opportunity to come up here. To Whistler three years later yeah you're still here, here we are um one of my best friends from high school at the time had a his parents had a house up here and they had uh, their brothers had moved away for school and oh, okay they had three months of uh vacation yeah that i was invited to come and join them for oh, um, man, they were job. they were too nice to me and charged me a couple hundred bucks a month and made dinner for me every night i didn't even pay for the food they got me and wow that's amazing um they had been uh, actually lived down the road for me most of my life. I pretty much ended up growing up at their <laughs> growing up at their house at this yeah. point. Um, but it's crazy just to be here now. Yeah. <laughs> that, 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 that's all it was. Yeah. Yeah, just got shown the, the life out here and then made the move. Do you think you had to make that, because I think you see a lot of people in that limbo zone that you're talking about for a very long time. Do you think yours was accelerated because you didn't have that, like, that support, that anything to fall back on? I think it's more the motivation than the the ease of the decision. Oh, okay. Whereas when, even still today, like uh, you have to look forward to beyond what you're going to do a little bit when you don't have a backup plan. Yeah. Like for a lot of my friends traveling after high school was the first thing they did. They've been saving all high school. They had 3,000 right. bucks in their pocket. Yeah. Boom. Right out of the country, come back with zero dollars. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Yeah, go back home, hang out, chill. Reset. Yeah. Uh, the toughest thing was actually when I was two weeks out of moving here. Yeah. I got hit with probably the biggest financial deficit I've ever had in my life. At the time, um, our our university course that we were doing for construction, okay. um, I had been expected to be covered by like a government grant that was going on for construction oh, yeah. at the time. Yeah. That ended up falling through, so our course ended up costing 1600 bucks. I was like, no problem. I've got ten thousand dollars to go up to Whistler. Yeah, no worries. Just a hit. Yeah, sixteen percent. Quick, <laughs> yeah. quick hit. Yeah. Um, 
our textbooks came in the next day. I was kind of expecting that one, but was still a little bit shocked. 600 yeah. bucks. Books, boom, down the drain. Yeah. Driving home from uh, from school, I think it was the day of. Yeah. Um, my clutch blew in my car. Yeah. Driving a race car at the time. It was a $3,000 clutch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Boom, Fucking no car. Enough, eh? No car and three, three grand down yeah. the drain. Uh, rent came up like the day before I left. Um, I can't even remember all of the succession of things, but uh, unfortunately we had a family member pass away at the same time. Oh my God. Flights booked for me and some of my family who didn't have the money to make it as well. Yeah. Um, so that was like almost the rest of it. I ended up moving to Whistler with like a thousand bucks in my pocket thinking I was so set to go. Yeah. And it's a real realization of what, of what can happen in life. And it all happens, it happens to all of us at some point. Yeah. But it, that was where I'd felt like I was happy to be prepared for that rather than yeah um, have that mindset of there's always a backup plan because yeah. that would have been a scenario where it could have really changed my life to the point where I would have been in Comox yeah for maybe another few years or so and at the time uh, most of my great friends had gone away to school and I was pretty much left on my own working I was working hard for a great company and uh, a great family actually who I was learning a lot from but yeah definitely didn't feel fulfilled yeah didn't enjoy it as much eh? well it set a different perspective on life for being there and spending my energy and my time on very simplistic views like a lot of people yeah. on the island had the the mentality to get a house and settle down yeah it's not very 20 years old ambitious yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's just like uh, you, you're not surrounded with enough drive and enough um, yeah. yeah it's very stagnant for in sure people's uh, aspirations yeah I hear you and it's easy to get kind of stuck in that way. I used to see a lot of my friends still smoke weed at the same beach every night at 9 p.m. Yeah. Go in the same spot. And a lot of them actually don't even have the drive to, to do a lot of the stuff I do is where, yeah. is where we miss connection now going back to meet with a lot of yeah. people I grew up with is that um, they have similar goals and aspirations as they did when they're in school. Yeah, right. Whereas nowadays for us, you can ask anyone in Whistler and who knows where they're from and yeah. why they're here. and but if they're here, they're probably, yeah, they have something they want to do. Exactly. It's a nice thing about Whistler. Yeah, everyone around here has, you know. Some kind dreams. of story. Yeah. Other than, as long as this isn't the record, my roommates. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, there's definitely a trap. But that's the thing with Whistler, though. It'll eat up anyone who doesn't have it and then spit them out. So there you go. The people that have been here long enough. I haven't heard that, but I, I like that. Yeah. I agree. The ones who survive. Got it, maybe. I totally agree. Yeah. It takes a lot. Yeah. A good amount of energy to be here too. Some people have different perspectives. Like I had a roommate last year who came here, 30,000 bucks or whatever, and he just came here to blow money. Yeah, totally. He was renting a room for- 30K, six months, boom, gone, peace. He was renting a room for like 1,500 bucks a month. Yeah. Goes by and then he realized he actually liked it and he was like, all my money's fucking gone. He had to go. (laughs) I think he's still sticking around, but- Yeah. um, A lot of people come here uh, Doug was telling me that from dining the other night that people come here like the metaphor I was or used was going to Vegas. Yeah, it's just like going to Vegas where you have a set amount of money set for this set amount of enjoyment. Yeah, which is supposed to bring you this amount of happiness the in this place. You know what I mean? Up. Yeah, but yeah, at know, least when I know you leave you Whistler, mean, you don't yeah. have the Vegas hangover. But <laughs> yeah, still though, um, you come here with like a predisposed yeah set of goals and money to spend and. Yeah, and that's probably why those people like you see some people in some shitty jobs, but I don't think they care because they're like, oh, well, I only need. They're like, I came here with this. And by the end, I, I don't expect to have anything. Yeah. yeah, so it just just holds me by for the six months till I go back home. This just extends my period of breaking even. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> if I come on the zero, it's perfect. Yeah, yeah, but I might have a few more weeks before that happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's such a different uh, thing than and we're trying not to. Yeah, end up at zero at any point here. You're trying to always exactly. Yeah. Well, we're trying to move forward, and I think that's the hardest thing about Whistler for a lot of us who would love to make a lifestyle here. Yeah. It's that sustainability and <laughs> sustainability is almost an, an impossibility. Yeah. Yeah, um, it really is. Especially when you look long term, you're like those things that, yeah, eventually you need somewhere to live that's sustainable. And, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's tough to think about it long term because you'd like to think you're going to be making a lot more money when you're older. But yeah. If you're paying a thousand bucks a month for the rest of your life, it's twelve thousand bucks a year. Yeah. By the time you're fifty years old, man, you could have bought a house. Yeah, it's a lot of money in rent. It's just overcoming that hurdle of what a down payment is out here to get in. 
Like you need a certain amount. Of well, I don't even think uh, it's a problem of like down payment for us. I think you need a certain amount of equity to be able. To oh yeah, to get a even loan make a purchase. I yeah. Remember when um, our close friend bought their last house is yeah. around two million dollars, and they needed three hundred thousand dollars down. Right. Yeah. Unless you have that in your pocket. Yeah. <laughs> like you need that to be able to put a down payment down. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like that's your down payment. That's crazy. Three hundred thousand dollars, like. If you're lucky enough to do that, you could own a full house somewhere else. Yeah, 300K goes a long way. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, it gets you a lifetime of payment here. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you may as well to think, to think far enough ahead to pay enough $2 million. Um, for, and for what you get too, like you probably get the same thing, you know, middle of BC for 300K that you're going to get here for like oh, yeah. $2 million. So. Nelson, Vancouver Island, yeah. are up around like out, outskirts of Kamloops. Oh, for sure. Like, it's a lot of beautiful areas as well that provide a lot of yeah. what we love here that just doesn't have the same luster. And it doesn't have the lifestyle though. I think what you lose though is that, that motivated people. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the group that everyone's of here friends. for a reason. Yeah, everyone's here because they want to make something of themselves a bit, you know, to at least a certain extent. Yeah. They want a better life than what they had. You know? For sure. Yeah. I was even just looking at some Whistler Tourism articles today. And yeah. There's some something written by someone passionate for mountain biking, something written for someone who's passionate for art, something yeah. written for someone who's passionate for snowboarding. These all aspects represented here. And yeah. um, pretty much no matter what sport or niche you fit into, yeah. you're probably going to find a group of friends who like the same thing. Yeah, and make it easy for you to stay inspired because there's always something. Yeah, you're, exactly. It's not always up to you to be like, okay, let's do this because there's someone else who's coming and saying, hey, let's do this thing or do that thing. And you'll always see someone better. Yeah, that's well. true too. Yeah, you're always, you're, it's very hard here to be at like the peak, the best at something. Yeah. And even the guys who are, you'd be like, well, I could, you may be the best at this, but that guy's got you there, or this and that. Exactly. And there's it's, such an influx of other people coming. That was the first thing it. I learned on the hill here. How psycho it is. How yeah. psycho it is. Like, yeah. I grew up with Darcy in Mount Washington. and I was, yeah, a little bit of it then. You get to watch him in the park, but he's the only guy. Yeah, yeah, true. <laughs> Maybe yeah, some yeah. of our homies, like Marcos was always a great shredder. And yeah. um, like we had their whole crew of friends, but... Um, to come out here and see like the average uh, scum yeah. <laughs> out there doing a back 10 off of yeah. that 70 foot jump. It's like it, the bar is for the bar for uh, a moderate level of sport <laughs> is much higher. Yeah, the level of riding here is insane. Even I felt the same when I started biking to fit in with most of the people you want to ride with who are average riders. Yeah. You gotta be able to hit all the jumps on A-line. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> From anywhere else in the world, like it's one of the gnarliest mountain bike runs on the planet <laughs> yeah the majority of, yeah. yeah yeah you come here like whoa but it makes, anywhere else in the world people it's it's mind-blowing to them yeah well, it makes your progression curve if you live here everything you do you just learn so quick yeah because the average is so high and the people around you just learn so fast yeah and most of those people who are usually people who are good at something are a decent teacher yeah and if you're a good learner if they're not a good teacher you can probably watch yeah and, and pick something apart see people that. do things right yeah so is a good sport for that because it's just your body yeah you're just watching someone do something yeah you don't need yeah yeah it's, it's not a, about how you crack the throttle it's not about no these little uh well not to dismiss technique but um, yeah technicality i guess whereas it's everything to do with your actual body not yeah. a lot of it's an extension of yourself more so than uh, controlling yeah. something. And it's specific knowledge. It's something that it can't be taught in the same way. Like you can't go to school to be a snowboarder, but you can go and watch someone in, in you know, on the job training. What does Joe call it? <laughs> Snow <Snow's> school? <laughs> yeah, the university, snowboard university. Yeah. yeah. That could be interesting. Yeah. Even then though, it's very, it's more intuitive. And the person who you're teaching has to get it. Like you can cue them, but they have to personally understand it and take a lot. That's what I think with learning how to snowboard is you have to take a lot of personal accountability and ownership towards your learning. Because yeah. if you don't think about it and understand it in your own head, no one can tell you how to do it. But like you said, if you can watch someone and you can understand it and apply yeah. it to yourself, that's the best way to learn it. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And that's a really good perspective for a lot of things. Yeah, having that accountability. Being, uh, I'm not sure what the right word would be for it, but being cueable. Like, yeah to be able to take those cues and direct direct like uh apply them directly to what you're doing yeah um whether it's a keeping your glutes engaged on the back 10 or whatever it is yeah. those minute muscles to be able to, to be able to do that without changing everything else right is 
the yeah. tough aspect of it with with when it comes to sport, especially an action sport where that yeah. um, minute miscalculation could cause injury. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, down the line. With anything, whether it's doing a deadlift at the gym or whether it's doing a back triple, like that yeah. small minute change has to be directed to exactly that body part. If you yeah. engage your glutes and you, all of a sudden you're standing up vertical, yeah, it's gonna fuck up everything else. Like you have to be cueable to that. Yeah, three, exact. Yeah, three degrees of the takeoff is like thirty degrees of the landing, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, it makes a big difference. Yeah, is that the same? No, but, <laughs> <laughs> I mean you could go with it, but it's that same. You know, like you know, two lines moving by a degree. By the end, they're way far apart. For sure. Yeah. Um, what's the word for that? Compound. <laughs> Compounding separation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot of the. Like I would say, you're someone who has a uh, pretty, you know, open set of skills through like a, a couple different, you know, things, and I think it's mm-hmm. helped you along. Um, a lot of those skills, though, would you say that came from uh, scenarios like that, where you were learning from someone versus like going to school for it, or or just picking things up on the job, kind of thing. Um, no, some of them I'm actually really proud of is how much self-taught. Okay. I've done a lot of things like. Um, I'm not sure exactly how it how it worked out, but throughout throughout high school, um, a lot of the courses I was really good at. Yeah. Um, obviously, it goes with anything, but the stuff you're interested in, you're going to be yeah. a lot more adapt to learning in. Yeah. But um, a lot of these courses, I take it upon myself to learn outside of school. Yeah. Um, and then all of the sports that I've actually been um, good at myself. Yeah. I haven't had the right teachers and stuff around me unfortunately yeah um through like my career in track yeah uh, right i moved from winning like our local little track meet every year yeah to realizing i was kind of good at this yeah um hey, went know. on to join like our local club and went on to join the provincial club yeah um and from the provincial club still didn't have any coaching um, right. because funny enough one of the teachers at my high school was the world's best high jump coach okay uh, for canada and yeah. he just retired because of how much it took away from his life with his family yeah um, so i'd amazing. obviously poked and prodded at this guy forever but never got him <laughs> sure. um, but unfortunately i had no coaching because uh tracks so specific yeah almost like doing half pipe or doing slope style yeah like your half pipe coach is probably not going to help you put a slope style run together no definitely not. like they might help know how to get you fit and how to carve better and yeah how to build your basics and stuff but specific to your sport you have no help yeah um and with high jump with that i was very proud that i was able to make it to a national level of competition and come home with the silver medal with board shorts and running shoes on yeah <laughs> whereas the the guy who got first ahead of me at the time uh, i always remember the name micah peters okay uh, a specimen of a human being yeah <laughs> at the time was like six six and i was i thought i was tall at six one and and he was um, just towering towering amazing athlete but he had a, a training team with him yeah um first of all i was registered uh as a solo athlete so i didn't even have a jersey <laughs> had wow. my t-shirt on yeah <laughs> they have their club massage therapists every uh, coaches yeah. people there for everything that they need there's people sharpening his the spikes in his shoes and stuff before you make your jump to that extent yeah um and it was almost laughable to be sitting there kind of like making it to the same table yeah so um how did you get there like what things did you take on did you just uh train more train harder or is it like um looking uh, things up unfortunately at the time actually we were just coming into the innovation of that availability of information yeah like, like now with the internet you to go forward learn. five years you could be professional at anything yeah they just started those courses master class right yeah gordon ramsay uh like the best at anything will create one of these classes yeah you gotta just sign up and <laughs> can get advice from one of the best in the world yeah. 10 bucks a um, month yeah pretty, exactly pretty cheap yeah at the time that stuff was just coming into fruition like, yeah and t- coming available to us yeah um so a lot of mine was through asking questions and watching people and um yeah. spending that extra time um i would go to a lot of meets actually i'd go um, i'd take the bus down to nanaimo which was our local biggest kind of track yeah um watch people like our our best local athletes yeah um and all I would wait for is those couple seconds where they're walking away to get a quick question in or this or that. Okay. Training tips and whatnot and trying to 
absorb that stuff as you go. Yeah. Otherwise it was mainly what felt good to my body. I was luckily naturally good with that specific sport and yeah. it's something that I just had to just do it myself. Could. Yeah. I'd you go could. there, I'd run 400 meters, I'd jump up the stairs, let alone knowing now I was doing calisthenic and yeah, now like, you know now. You've got a crazy vertical. Yeah. From that, but funny enough, it was always a one foot until I broke my left ankle. Oh yeah. I could only ever jump off of one foot. I could dunk a basketball from grade nine forward on my left foot. Yeah. And it took breaking my ankle to be able to jump off two feet. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Whereas some people are the complete opposite. They have a forty inch vertical off both. Yeah, feet but they and can't, they can't do run the one in foot. with one leg. Yeah. But Yeah, it's like the specific technicalities of high jump, hey. Funny things with our athleticism. We're all good at something horrible at the next. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of doubling down on whatever you're good Most at. Most rugby players can't play badminton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, just because you're a professional here doesn't mean you'll be a professional there. But it does go hand in hand with a lot of things. Like, Darcy was a piece on the football fields just as much as he was on the I could see that. On the snowboard. Yeah, but he's just got to get like a tank of a body. Yeah. He's also a specimen. You could say that. Yeah. Yeah. For, uh, guy who doesn't uh, until this summer actually really hit the gym yeah the most built dude i know <laughs> <laughs> naturally ripped but yeah he's been working hard but yeah yeah but the change is just the muscles that are there just look a little bit bigger now yeah yeah i've been going to the gym for four years i was always smaller than that guy <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that's a circumstance issue but not much you can do about it that's for sure besides all the stuff you can do about it yeah yeah I always change it yeah yeah so you've been here three near, three years now. December, two thousand sixteen. Yeah. Graduation year. So you're. Would you have been yeah December prior to New Year's obviously I guess. Oh okay. So you would have been you graduate early then, or is that or graduate uh, late? No, we graduate in July June, but it yeah. would have been prior to the oh, new year okay, obviously. Okay. So it was yeah. right at the end of that. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, year, so I was technically getting here right for twenty seventeen. Nice. Three years later and. Um, only thing I kind of regret is maybe just doing a little bit of traveling, but yeah, you know, our life is so exciting here that. that it's, yeah. uh, I don't feel like I've missed anything. Yeah. It's only the occasional day like this where you get some rain outside and oh, that's nice, down yeah. a little bit, but yeah. um, I don't know. Today okay. was actually specifically a really tough day to get out, to get out of bed. Yeah. Um, that's why I think Whistler is a really great place to, to be disciplined and right. to try and stick to your guns because it's really easy to fall back like you were saying before for people who yeah do drugs here or end sure. up going to the bar every night it's really easy to get unmotivated on the rest of everything and yeah. stick into that what was it today you think like class was pulling you i woke up late yeah. boom that's an instant bad start from my first hour of my day it yeah always, that always bugs me when i wake up with plans to do something i wake up late i'm all instantly like wasted hour kind of thing yeah it yeah. Uh, something that's always really bugged me actually yeah wasted hour i guess yeah wasted hour and somehow it compounds into making the next decision even harder yeah that's where that momentum goes comes into play is missed you, it already does it really matter if i do this does it matter if i do that you wake up late feel a little fucked yeah you get out of bed usually you're a little slower in the morning yeah it's just about making that next step and it is true like that's why being disciplined a lot of the times actually makes us feel better at the end of the day like all i had to do today was get to the gym it took me a fucking hour and a half but by the time i left should have fucking done that in the first 20 minutes of waking up would have felt a yeah. lot better yeah um, half of it's just getting there though sometimes like just in those situations that's that's like the key. you made it there at the end of the taking day taking the step thing. yeah making the move yeah getting yourself over there getting out of the house whatever it is that first step towards what you need to do yeah it's often the hardest one like a lot of us can sit there procrastinate forever like i was just saying about maybe doing some traveling out of whistler here all this is a plane ticket away yeah totally just gotta take the step to book the ticket <laughs> yeah make the money line it up book the ticket go that's the easy part though you think so the planning is, yeah the direction for me at least that stuff's easy it's making the move to be like okay now i'm gonna do this. i'm scared to take new steps to book the ticket yeah to yeah book the, book the ticket i hear you man it's it's frightening especially especially the stuff like that where it's just it's really the, the big unknowns where it's a big step out your coming zone you're like okay i'm gonna put mags in this packet i'm gonna go huge run unknowns. Forward. yeah but those unknowns will be nothing but regret for us if we don't do them we're still yeah you kind of have to yeah and if you want to do it 
and it's just a decision of whether you're going to do it or not. It's either a decision of like whether you're going to regret it or whether you're going to do it. Exactly. But either way, one of them is going to happen. So yeah. it's like regret it or do it. Yeah. There you go. Something you can stick with forever. Was um, starting the cafe this summer? Was that something that you were nervous jumping into, or did it? Ne- you Extremely. Just, you really? Okay. Yeah. Um, excited in the case that I did feel like I had something to present, yeah. uh, an opportunity to um, kind of display a bit of creativity. Right, yeah. Um, although it was like one of the most important things I learned in cooking as as a kid is that you have to earn your creativity. Okay. Um, through going through your ranks. So does that hierarchy. mean like staying simple in the beginning or? Um, just in the fact that if you're a dishwasher, I don't see want to see what you made me for dinner. Oh, right. <laughs> like uh, creativity with no merit. Like yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, do your job well until you you've garnered enough. You've experience. gained the opportunity to show me something. Oh, okay, yeah. You, as an artist, cooking is definitely a form of art, but yeah, um, it's kind you of. You have to yeah. You said it, it said it very well to gain that merit. Yeah. Uh, to be able to display something, to someone, and I, I still felt like I hadn't really made it there. Yeah. Um, but. Opening it was a really cool opportunity for me to, uh, first of all, get from a managerial standpoint to hire staff, yeah, meet people, and project myself a little bit differently. Yeah, as I'm constantly try to be very friendly with people, um, you do have to enforce a bit of discipline. You do have right. to um, show a bit of power in your leadership role. Yeah, uh, to have people respect you as well. But um, I think you're in Whistler with the environment we have around kitchens, um, just treating your staff well is gonna be your best bet to get people to stick around. Cause, pretty much enough, yeah. Exactly, because with with where we are here, no one's got any respect for their workplace. Everyone figures they their workplace needs them more than yeah. they need the job. Yeah. Uh, and it's the worst thing in the kitchen, going back to what I was talking about. Skip work so hard, I feel like, yeah. Whereas I grew up, um, the only way you'd get into one, whether you five years experience or not yeah wash some dishes yeah right <laughs> let me see your fast <laughs> yeah <laughs> go from there and you really have to earn your stripes all the way through and a lot of these jobs um and a lot of the best teachers i've had and best chefs i've worked for worked a second job the whole time they were learning and get, gaining that information right so that they could have their job yeah imagine that finishing your job at 6 p.m and going to another job just so you could afford to wake up and go to work tomorrow <laughs> yeah <laughs> paying, um, paying for the experience kind of thing exactly and yeah. um, for a lot of those people that I respect the most um, they were able to do that day in day yeah. out those kind of skills are becoming invaluable though I would say because like you said you, you need that that mentor and you're not going to get that kind of knowledge anywhere else so yeah yeah. but that's where that same uh, respect as an employee comes into play whereas right you have total respect for your mentor or your teacher. Yeah. You take them one step at a time. If you're a prep cook, you take that respect uh, to your demi or to your chef de party or whoever your teacher is or your yeah. uh, superior at the time. And you don't look three steps past. Yeah. To, to, to be in that top dog kind of thing. Exactly. Too like, quickly. Yeah. Yeah. You take, take your step at a time. And it was a cool opportunity for me to really wrap my head around what a business is like as well. Did you kind of gain more respect for people in that role like just seeing how all of it works and stuff like that more so seeing how how far it affected me outside of work oh, okay every day i'd come home i was either getting some sort of phone call right about whatever's going on some sort of phone call from my staff yeah realizing the responsibility especially of a small business with yeah. your staff and how trusted you need to be that when someone's sick you are the backup yeah like unless you get to that point we had seven staff members so wow. someone's not showing up there's not a huge variety of people who can yeah, pull from step a couple, in but exactly yeah. um and that's a huge part of it is how much it actually affects your outside daily life um, yeah whether it's stress about ordering whether you have enough stock for the next day yeah um balancing all of that and a personal life yeah was actually what I think has finally taken me a step away from cooking rather than pursuing a, a career in learning Okay. in that aspect. I don't think I ever see myself doing it as a lifestyle like I did when I was young. Yeah. Just because of the lack of lifestyle. That that, that kind of um, career provides because you go to bed thinking about it, you wake up thinking about yeah. it, and it doesn't provide you with any 
time away because when you go away, there's no one else to kind of do it kind of thing. Yeah. And I do totally appreciate um, the discipline that it takes. And that's obviously yeah. being a bit of a pussy. That's the thing that scares me away from doing it. Like I said, with those, all of my best mentors have had two jobs just to be able to afford to have their job. It's, yeah. It takes work. It takes serious work to get to a place yeah. where you feel like you've learned enough to go off on your own. Yeah. I was actually just having this experience with someone uh, at the last hotel I was managing there. Right. Um, we had taken on uh, a part-time chef who used to be the head chef at Barefoot Bistro. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, or the sous chef, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah. And he was just going off on his first own venture at probably in, into his 30s, late 30s. Yeah. Uh, and he was actually one of those people as well who'd worked another job to sustain his, his yeah. job most of his life. And to be late in your 30s and just having your first opportunity to do something on your own. Yeah. I really appreciate the level of discipline it takes and what it teaches you as a person. Yeah. But the lack of experience in the outside part of your life yeah. to me is not going to be worth it. Yeah, I hear. But you can take those skills that you learn. Like, exactly. More than anything what I've taken from the kitchen is that matter of discipline. Yeah, and apply them to things that provide you the lifestyle you want. Yeah. Because... I think like, you know, I've heard this a couple of times, like the guy working at the corner store versus someone like Elon Musk, they're probably working equally as hard. They're just in different avenues. So their yields are different. So if you can take those skills of hard work and put them towards something that maybe just gives you that lifestyle that you want, you can get, get to a better place, I guess. Of course, it's something going on yeah. all around the world is that um, some people feel like they're being discriminated against because yeah. they're poor and they work just as hard as the next guy. And, that's the kind of view we've put on society is that you need to work harder. Yeah, right. You need to keep working harder. But a lot of the times it's about the way you work or what you work on is really matters too. And a lot of what's going on in your life, like a lot of really hardworking people are alcoholics, yeah. drug addicts, all of these things factor into um, what your outcome is going to be. Yeah, you need the whole picture for sure. You need the whole picture. Yeah, it doesn't matter how hard you work during the week if you blow it all the weekend. On a bunch of coke or something like that <laughs> exactly and then you wonder why, why you're back at square one yeah um but yeah that whole opportunity um it actually started more of a as a a chance to understand how a business works okay um as i said prior like not having the money for post-secondary at the moment yeah it was an opportunity to look at a business with someone else's credit card <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and be able uh to t take that stance back yeah. Um, instead of doing it my first time on my own, which is uh, like having my own cafe has been a dream of mine since I was a little kid. Yeah. I never thought it would come into fruition at 21 years old. Yeah. But to not have to take that chance with your own money and your own dollar. Right. Is a huge um, like motivator and a bit made things quite a bit easier to make that decision. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot, of a lot of lighthearted decisions. Even when you do your ordering every single night before you leave the restaurant, you know, you really double check whether you need that extra box of onions for tomorrow right when it's your cash yeah i know what you mean because it's way higher risk and in a small business aspect like that like you're you're just balancing food costs rent costs labor yeah versus the income yeah food costs is a huge one it's usually trying to stay around 30 percent. yeah and that's where your profits come from is that margin between the 30 percent of the food cost because you can't just start paying people less yeah most of the time you can't just get less rent yeah <laughs> you can't, you can't just be like we're not making rate. enough money i need to pay less for my rent space yeah um so the money comes in, in food there and you really you will have take to a second that. think when it's yeah. coming out of your pocket you really have to think about it twice yeah yeah it's one of those things that and say so i guess it's a lifestyle choice because whoever's pocket it's coming out of also all the money come going back in is going into their pocket so they either make it all or they lose it all yeah that kind of accountability but i mean i can't imagine it must be on your mind all the time though exactly and i can't even imagine for me it was the uh not because the, the the money wasn't directly coming back in my own pocket but yeah. i wanted to show profitability to our managers and stuff. yeah so that stress was still there yeah to to make the right decisions and yeah um obviously it has to be to drive a business in the right direction you can't have yeah people who are unconnected um, but once again, unfortunately with this position, actually I had zero help. Yeah. <laughs> we had no management staff above me. Uh -huh. Um, I was given an investment to build this restaurant space actually from a white room. Okay. Um, 
So from scratch, essentially. Starting with yeah. uh, the fact that I was supposed to have uh, help from some carpenters and electricians uh -huh. to help me put this place together. Lucky enough, I went to school for carpentry because <laughs> once we're a month away from opening and there was no work done, I decided yeah. to take it into my own hands and get it done, build man. this place myself, go down to Vancouver with credit card and buy all the equipment and I need to and whatnot. Yeah. Um, and then after everything had actually kind of come together, um, I was expecting to have some help with the management side of things, hiring my staff, getting to know them all, um, what a training aspect would look like, uh, what maybe um, kind of menu they would like to serve, what um, really any logistics of the business were left to myself. <laughs> yeah, it all came down to you at the end of the day kind of thing. And not in the way that um, no one else was there to help, just that everyone else had been designated to something separate. Yeah. No one had been designated to even put a, an ounce of thought into this section of the business. Yeah. I was left to myself and it was through a funny change of management right prior to me taking the position. We had lost our, our operations manager and changed over and that information wasn't passed along. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was kind of left to it, but um, once again, an amazing opportunity for learning um, until I found closer to the end. Um, you really do need a structure you do, around yeah. you of help yeah. and aid. Being the top dog without someone by your side yeah, likely isn't the best situation. I don't think there's any CEO in the world without the Oh, it doesn't have a right hand man, a left hand man, and like 20 more around yeah, him kind of exactly. thing. Exactly. Um, yeah, you need to be able to that delegate. helps more important than anything. You yeah. can't you can't be the leader and have ten people who are five steps below you. No, you can't do everything. That's probably I'd say the hardest thing to find in Whistler is is that right hand man. Yeah, because you're. It seems like there's either the people who want to be the top dogs, or there's like yeah, buddy with thirty k that just wants to blow it. He doesn't want to take any responsibility because exactly. he's not thinking about the job. He's thinking about when he's leaving. Finding those those people that want to work up and that want the knowledge is probably pretty tough. Yeah. But like I said, that's why we have, that's why it's such an amazing place for someone like myself. Yeah. All I have to do is walk into somewhere with a job opportunity. Right. And most of the time, just because you have the right head on your shoulders, yeah. they're going to be able to train you or teach you how to do something that maybe you're totally unqualified for. Yeah. Or is actually a very difficult position to come upon um, just because of the need for staff. There's right. no one else around. They're going to train the most competent, most common sense person. That's he's willing. probably got the best, yeah, yeah. best, uh, best opportunity to do it. Yeah. Do you think Whistler, yeah, because of its environment, provides people with maybe the lack of experience, but the willingness to learn and the the willingness to take on accountability, better opportunities than somewhere else that has more of a, a mass of experienced people? Yes and no. I mean, people every day have a different perspective on it. Yeah. I, yeah. Like you said, a lot of people just want to go in there and get their shit done and go right back to their outside life. Yeah. Um, a lot of people don't think of work as an opportunity for growth or to move forward or and anything. to learn yeah. or anything like that. Yeah, it's a paycheck at the end of the day. But I do believe that there is, unfortunately, a smaller group of people who take those opportunities and um, really take them as learning opportunities to take yeah. positions outside of their comfort zone. Yeah. Um, and as long as you have the right mentors and people there to train you, it can be an amazing opportunity for a lot of people. They don't realize that that's taken a whole new step in your life. To, a job is where most of us spend most of our time. And yeah. if you're doing something you don't like for more time than you do anything else in your life. Yeah. It's like spending 10 hours of your day in bad posture yeah. and going to the gym for an hour, standing up straight and expecting everything to be all right. Yeah, totally. You're going to work for 10 hours, five days a week. Yeah. If you hate what you're doing every day, going and doing something fun for three hours after work is not going to reset waking up tomorrow for another 10 hours yeah. of misery. Not going to make you love your life kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and it's a weird thing we do as people, but happiness comes from growth. Yeah, totally. We need to be growing. Yeah. To be happy people. To go through things that are difficult and uh, yeah, challenge you as a person and make you learn, things like that. That's yeah. why some of the most wealthy people in the world who are very well educated, super smart people. Yeah. They're still working their asses off because they're not done yet. Yeah. Until I agree. you feel like you've accomplished what you're doing, it's unlikely that you're gonna feel fulfilled in yeah. your happiness with what you have going on. I'm definitely starting to fall more in love with like not getting tricks. 
like if it's taking a longer time, I'm like, oh, this is sick. Like this one's gonna like, I, I'm starting to love more the, the actual trying it as yeah. well as like if it takes longer, I know it's gonna feel even better when you do get it. That versus just versus just the trick. Like I heard it as this was the analogy. It's it's like the ice cream sundae and say the trick or whatever is the cherry on top. Yeah. But like the meat and potatoes bit, that whole like, you know, that's what really matters. So you kind of have to love that otherwise. And that's like the, the work is the meat and potatoes. Yeah. If you don't love it, it's the cherry. It's still sweet, but it doesn't really matter. You know? Exactly. Well, it come from actually one of our good friends recently that they were so happy for the season to come. Yeah. They're so excited and waiting and waiting and waiting. And they just can't wait for it to start. Yeah. And that was something I had always done when I was young, when I was going through hardships is trying push things off to when the next great event is. Oh, you're looking forwards at that, yeah. If you live your life like that every day, you miss the journey and the journey is the only important part. Yeah. Once you arrive somewhere that you didn't deserve or you didn't work hard for, you're not gonna be stoked to be there. Yeah. It's just like every day we wake up, like if you, for a lot of people say you wanna start going to the gym. If you kinda wanna start going to the gym Yeah. and you don't go, you're gonna be kinda unhappy. Yeah. If you make it, a decision in your life yeah a need rather than a want to yeah. start doing something yeah when you don't do it it's gonna hurt a yeah. hell of a lot and that motivation is a lot more important um kind of needs to consume you exactly and you need to put enough effort in that you'll be just as disappointed as the effort you put in or else there's no drive to <laughs> keep doing keep what you're doing, doing. It. yeah you, same thing if you with your snowboarding career if you didn't go to practice all week and you go to a meet or uh, an event yeah you blow it some people get really bummed on it but they don't understand really why and that's i think just a matter of miseducation but yeah for a lot of intelligent people they're well i didn't do very well yeah. that's fine well because it's, it's an experience like experience passes every yeah. day like that you that's a tough thing when you focus on those big moments is that that moment is short and it passes just like each day passed up until that point and it's yeah. just gonna fleet away but if you spent every day yeah enjoying it when that moment of disappointment passes you're able to stay in the moment and just keep moving forward i think really and i think the out. fulfillment you get from that is also based quite a bit on how hard you work i've heard that yeah self-esteem is based on your prior actions kind of thing like you feel as good as how much work you put in fair enough like you know if you if you woke up this morning felt shitty but you didn't go to the gym that would weigh on your mind. I'd still me. be feeling shitty. Yeah, you'd be thinking about it. Even. I might not even came here. <laughs> yeah, you're like I didn't, I didn't do that, and then you don't want to do this. No, I, it, you kind of need to know that the repercussions of those small actions are bigger than I think a lot of people, you know, really take the time to. Yeah, not going to bed the night before. Every yeah, little thing. It's, it all adds up. Life's a compounding effect of. <laughs> yeah, compound interest is a strong thing, <laughs> and it can go both ways. Yeah, it's like agreed. if that one straight line, if you're going to the right, positive way go good if you're going the other way you go back fast momentum factor oh. what a little drink? spill on the podcast <laughs> yeah what uh what flavor you got there i had some black and blue healthy hooch going on is it a uh, kombucha yeah this nice. one's a nice one nice little organic like a fairly local brand oh that's sweet from abbotsford nice and jc branch yeah um Never thought I'd like it. My sister gave me a kombucha like two years ago, and I was like, that's a beer that you left out in the sun that's gone bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, until this year, I started doing some research on our microbiome as people, and yeah. our gut's pretty much what controls a lot of what you think. Yeah. Um, it, it's tough to get the things that fermented foods provide you, pretty much because you need to eat fermented things, and that's yeah. such an easy way to get the get it like in vitamin K and things like that. Some weird stuff that you might not get elsewhere. Yeah. I heard that if you cold cooked and then cooled potatoes have the similar effects, like m nutrients in them that something fermented does. Interesting. Yeah. So like, I guess the cooling effect of the cooked potato and the more times you do it, the more times you get that benefit. It like doubles Crazy. up in these compounds. Um, but yeah. So that's one of those ones that's so confusing on our nutrition is that one person could be doing the same thing to the next, cooking their broccoli versus steaming it and yeah. getting something else out of it. Well, nutrition, I there's so much confusion. Yeah, it's crazy. I feel like the if any area has a large amount of misinformation, it's nutrition. 
Seriously. Yeah. Especially compared to how we've been growing up. Think about what our parents were told to feed us when we were kids. Oh, straight up. Slam the milk down the throat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nowadays, we're half of us don't even drink milk. Yeah. Whereas that was probably the biggest staple in our diet growing up. Oh, dude. Uh, things like whole wheats. Yeah. Are now known to have a massive amount of lectin, which is a gut destroying bacteria. Yeah. And the little tiny staples that were brought through from our government, things like fat was bad. Yeah. Which was that pretty was, much like the sugar industry paying to say that Government funded commercials. Bad. Yeah. And Propaganda. How could our parents lie to like yeah. think, think that they were being lied to? Yeah. And that got passed along to us. Like some of the stuff we were fed as being healthy as a kid was almost insane to. Oh, I know. Think but even on. these days, like that's like you talk about the information age, um, you can learn how to do so many things. But with, I feel like with nutrition, it just there. I think maybe because it's every person maybe needs different things. That could be the cool thing about DNA testing. I've heard that, you know, building your diet off of your DNA yep. can be a new thing that's coming out. Some things are good for people. Some things are bad for other like, people. I know Mikey and Darce, they've seen a doctor in the city that... Yep. They, they just did the 23 and like DNA tests and they're they're basing it off of what their physiology is, which is pretty For cool. Sure. Super important too. Like yeah. one of us could eat a slice of white bread and have an insulin spike through the roof. Yeah. And have a huge metabolic response and the next person stays totally level. Yeah. Okay. It's just different body types. Different people. Yeah. And well, different lineages, different cultures. Like Yeah. yeah. Big thing with nutrition and diet and even working out as well is we all respond differently and it is an individual yeah. uh, journey. Yeah, and everyone has different goals too. Like that's probably the biggest problem with the fitness industry is all these programs, yeah, all these uh, not um, personalized diets. Like just do this. Oh yeah, you send it out to a bunch of people. You're like this works sort yeah. of for like fifty percent of people. So fifty percent <laughs> of you are gonna be pretty stoked. Yeah, the rest, well, it's you know, it's we'll see what happens. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Crazy, yeah. crazy thing. Yeah, is that tapered over into like? You know, because you have a lot of cooking experience. Is it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do you, like, say you're creating the menu for the cafe, did you think about that? Or do you, for sure. do you have to balance, like... I think about what, almost painfully to the effect of what I'm doing to people yeah. when I'm serving bad things. Like things that you know aren't very healthy, but, but are delicious. Good. And you know on that bottom line, they're going to sell really good. Exactly. But they're not going to be good for people. For sure. Yeah. It actually is a little guilty... Oh, it's like a moral dilemma. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I would love to only serve the nicest quality organic produce, but yeah. man, it'd be tough to make a dollar off a salad. Right, <laughs> like, yeah. It would be so expensive. Organic lettuce next to the next is three times the price. Yeah. Whereas for myself, I'd go home and only, only eat that way and yeah. come into work and feed everyone else a separate way. It's a funny, funny way to live, but yeah. um, it actually also introduced me to how little of the population we are who actually care that much. True. A lot of people don't have, but I mean, they have different goals for life. They don't really yeah. care about maximizing athletic you know, performance. And yeah. Human potential. Yeah. For me, it's a lot of mindful performance as well. I, I know how cloudy I am on a, on yeah. a bad diet um, and how hard it is to keep your thoughts straight. Um, yeah. Mental performance is, especially, it's funny in physical pursuits, I think it's almost more of a benefit to be mentally strong than it is to be physically strong. I'd say so as well. Yeah for like we talked about earlier for the fact of just getting there for your workout today yeah if you're not mentally strong and you're not disciplined you might be ready to go but almost none of us are going to wake up feeling 100 percent every day no yeah. like i said today i feel like a piece of shit but yeah bang it out get there get it done and then t- by the time you head home you're usually feeling quite a bit better Yeah, you feel a lot better after doing it but, and that's yeah and that's pretty much it it's just getting there and doing it but yeah, like if you were just, you know, physically strong, it wouldn't matter if you never got there. You wouldn't get any physically stronger, but yeah. That makes a little sense. Runs down the line. Um, if I can ask you a question. Yeah, go for it. Do you find um, starting to do these podcasts and starting to talk to people from more of an interviewer's um, perspective has uh-huh. um, aided your conversation skills outside of Outside of podcasting, I heard a really interesting quote recently that one of the least taught, most important skills in our schooling is basic conversational competency. Yeah. Most of us can't have a good conversation. No. A lot of us are, uh, the saying was people in the same place yelling out barely related sentences. Yeah. That's how a lot of our conversations go nowadays. Conversations involve listening. Yeah. And returning. Yeah. I (laughs) Oftentimes, (laughs) stating an opinion... And someone else will state a separate one is how our conversations go these days. Yeah, you you're find not, you're, you're getting better and better at talking to people. 
Yeah, I, you definitely notice that when people are talking at someone versus talking, you know, talking with them. Yeah. Um, I think I definitely have gotten more conscious of it. And plus, like, listening, like, I listen, I'll usually record them and then I'll listen to them at work to, like, mm -hmm. see if I need to make any edits or anything like that. So just listening to yourself talk for hours on end is, yeah, a pretty good indicator. Um, I would say prior to even doing this, though, um, I think my... My mom, she's a doctor, yep. um, and at her work, there was, um, I'd say like some, to put it briefly, like uh, systematic issues at the hospitals and things like that. And it really um, prompted her to work on her communication a lot over the last five years or so. Mm -hmm. And, you know, being away from home for so long, you always end up calling home. And I think a lot of the times I would just listen to her speak on those things. So I'd yeah. say that I've been conscious of that kind of stuff for a while, but doing the podcast, yeah, it's definitely changed, changed things a bit, mainly in the fact of listening. Like you're just like, I'm not, yeah. I'm not here for me. I'm here to listen to the other person. And my goal when I'm here is just to help people, um, or not even help people, but just let people fully expand their ideas and give people a platform to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's uh, said well by Celeste Headley, but if yeah. you if you want to state your opinion without any chance for rebuttal yeah. or construction, yeah. write a vlog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, film yourself. Don't bring other people on. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and that's what a lot of people end up doing in an average conversation with each other. Yeah. Stating an opinion without any room for growth yeah. or challenge. No, a conversation shouldn't be there for you to make yourself look good. Yeah. Yeah. Talk shouldn't be cheap. Talk shouldn't be cheap at all. Is Celeste Headley, did she do that, the TED Talk on like 10 yes. ways to, I've, I've watched that. It's quite Beautiful. Good. Yeah, very, very good. Beautiful way to take into consideration. I actually try to watch it at least uh, every couple of weeks. Yeah. Because um, said by her as well, it's something, conversational competency is something you will always need to practice throughout your life. Yeah. We're programmed to do things the way we talk. Yeah. We're programmed not to listen. We're programmed to talk about ourselves because we we release serotonin from talking about ourselves. Yeah. Like, oh, it's a, we yeah. gain happiness from talking shit. Yeah. Without the chance to reply. Yeah. Like just being able to be there. It's probably why podcasts work so well. People just love talking about themselves. Yeah, and just talking out and saying shit. Yeah. <laughs> it's an amazing thing to be heard. It is, yeah. I think what I've learned from listening to people, like there was a uh, one guy who was talking about um he became uh he started this thing called lyrical lemonade mm -hmm. it was a sort of like a hip-hop website he started making music videos anyways but he ended up sort of blowing up and spending a lot of time around some really influential people um and what he noticed was the people who were at the top they they didn't want to be understood they wanted to understand so when he was this kid showing up in all these meetings with these these really impressive successful people they all wanted to hear about him and he thought, this is crazy. Why do they want to know from me? And he's like, because they're always trying to learn from other people. And I think that's a communication skill is to want to understand people. And yeah, listening with the intent, to, with the intent to actually yeah. understand. Even I, this you ever heard of Naval Ravikant? Yeah. No. Uh, he's a he he runs a podcast called the Naval Podcast, um, and the reason he started that is because he did this tweet storm on how to. It's how to get rich without getting lucky, but really it's just wealth creation. But he says, don't don't go to business classes, don't study business, anything. He's like, the things you need to learn are, like he thinks like, you know, there's microeconomics, there's a couple arithmetic things like that, but it's, it's conversational stuff is a huge one. Being able to, you know, uh, articulate your ideas to other people is yeah. much more important than... You and know, you need to be able to change that depending on who you're talking to. Exactly, yeah. Because CEO of one company might think you're a psycho, whereas the next person might understand the way you're saying it. Yeah. You need to be a bit of a chameleon in that way. Yeah. And you know, to project yourself in the way people want to hear you. Yeah, knowing your skills is good too. Knowing if you're like, you know, a one-on-one -on -one communicator, if you're better, like you're a better writer, communicate that way. Even just knowing your skills outside of that and trying not to talk shit about stuff you don't know anything about yeah that's probably the hardest thing with this i've noticed like okay i can't just shoot the now shit, that on shit on the record, that I, yeah. yeah like well just in the in sense of like i don't want to yeah spread misinformation and i yeah yeah like uh, so it's it's learning how to speak on 
things you know. I mean, I'm not too worried about it. I don't try and censor myself in that sense. Yeah. But, but yeah, definitely more particular and more articulate too. Like yes. say what you mean. Things like that. And we're in a crazy fucking world these days where every conversation you enter is a chance to offend somebody. <laughs> yeah, dude, that is for sure crazy. First time in human history. Yeah. Where uh, anything you say, anything and everything can yeah. be used against you. And not necessarily tomorrow, <laughs> but 10 years from now, they could pull up your... Uh, Blackface they could, photo. <laughs> just about to say they could pull yeah. up and uh, knock you with one of those. Which is, yeah. Yeah. Have you watched any like stand-up specials recently? Um, Darcy's really trying to get me on the Ricky Gervais one, just because of apparently some very vulgar <laughs> stuff. Comedy. Yeah. Um, I listened to some Dave Chappelle recently. Yeah. Um, I really appreciate him as a comedian. I don't fully connect with a lot of his laughs yeah um the, but, uh, the reason i ask is because they're all just like this is the age where we have to be so careful and that's it seems like it's yeah, attacking they the all t- touch on yeah. something to do with that joe rogan as well halfway through his comedy special to just go hey guys just so you know these are jokes <laughs> <laughs> in case you didn't know we're joking here yeah. <laughs> no, I, I might not mean everything i say yeah. throughout this uh well, yeah a little bit of truth in every joke, but I definitely don't. Yeah, that's the thing. Taking the spin on it, yeah, um, in the right way, I guess. Yeah, but that's something I guess they used to watch at the comedy store. All these comedians uh, came together on that. Is that comedians have a fucked up sense of comedy? Oh, for sure. Yeah, the, the right the stuff that the comedians find funny. Yeah, is so much gnarlier than the stuff that the audience exactly. find funny. So yeah. there is people there who are the comedians' comedians. Yeah. No one's fucking laughing other than the one table. The, the guys back of the in the room. back are losing their And minds. all they come is for that laugh. Yeah. Oh, that, that was, um, oh, you can move that up if you want. You go like, yeah, two centimeters. Oh, I realized what happened. Zach came in. Oh, he sat on it. <laughs> sat on my wire. Um, yeah, even Jerry, he did the, um, what was it, like Comedians in Cars episode? Yep. And he goes, yeah. He, he said, I got, yeah, notice, or um, someone came up and told me that my friend died the other day. And he's like, I laughed. <laughs> he's like, he said it was, you know, good riddance to him or something like that. He's like, everything's funny to a comedian. He's like, there's a joke in everything. Fair enough. Yeah. Man, I would love to start putting pieces together. Writing down shit you'd think of that's hilarious. Yeah. Maybe one day you can put a comedy special together. I, think- I actually think it's a great representation of all the things we've been talking about today. Comedy. Of your discipline, of your yeah. competency in conversation. And you're understanding other people. Yeah. What they might think's funny and what's not. Yeah, you, you need to have a good sort of uh, take on society and people to know what, how this is going to hit and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah, and your audience. And your audience, yeah. Um, you might go one place or the next and totally different. I think it's one of the most difficult art forms. Like it's so intellectual. For sure. Way more than I think people put it on to be. For sure. I had never even thought of Kevin Hart as a not not that I had ever thought of him as a dumb person, but as an, an intellectual. An intellectual, yeah. And he has some of the most difficult writing processes and hardest on himself out of any comedian in the world. He will start yeah. from uh, small local venues of 20, 30 people, yeah. hear how the laugh sounds, put out a couple jokes, if yeah. it goes well, to the local theater of a few hundred, um, to the lo- local biggest city, yeah. do a small show there, if it doesn't sound good, he'll start right back over again from 20 people. Right, yeah. Move his way all the way through to playing a couple thousand person theaters before he'll do a special. Yeah. And it's years and years of trying these same jokes, yeah. spinning them, taking different pauses at different points in your sentence, allowing people to make connections just to put out... He's working out. Yeah, the, he's... Right, the right 15 words in order. Yeah. <laughs> that people are going to find funny. Yeah. And I'd say that's why he's so successful. And you can... Well, Zacho... You can pull that to uh, other areas too, like to expect to get the same results as Kevin Hart, but not put in the same work. Like extreme people get extreme results kind of thing. Of course. And playing stupid games gives you stupid prizes. (laughs) (sighs) Yeah. Well, we all get a participation trophy at least. Yeah. Well, (laughs) these days. Or we just get a coffin. In our crazy nerfed up world. Yeah. It is a crazy world these days. Strange times, as Joe would say. Yeah. Oh, we grew up right in the middle of it. I actually really appreciate uh, the age we've grown up in as we developed through a lot of these changes at, at the 
at the age that they're changing for people. Yeah. For us, we were introduced to technology as it was coming out at the age that people were meant to use it. Yeah. Like, what were we, nine or 11 years old or so when the first smartphone came out? Yeah, I think it's a iPhone kind of... one little block thing. Yeah. Um, like, that was stuff was coming out at the time where we were available to use it. Yeah. Like, we had our first computer when we were seven or eight or whatever. Yeah, like there was a computer in our house kind of thing. Yeah. And we had access to it. Yeah, and you you move through that stuff and learn how to how to use it all. Mm -hmm. um, same with a lot of these social changes and stuff that we're adapting to. Yeah. Um, I see like a lot of parents and stuff still don't know how to use a computer because they were 45 when it came out. And yeah. what the hell is that? <laughs> no, I know. We're lucky enough to be in it enough that we can see it, but also have seen what the life was like before. Exactly. To, people... to still understand that five yeah. years later and be in the 2000s, we still understand what going to your friend's house and knocking on the door is like. Yeah. Or making a phone call through a landline. Yeah. Like talking to their yeah. dad when she. Because the change the there was severely minuscule compared to the change we've experienced from childhood to our young adolescence. Yeah. Whereas our parents went from Pong to Game Boys. Yeah. We went from Game Boys to virtual reality with body sensors that make you feel like you're actually getting shot in the video game <laughs> yeah the curve is steep at this point <laughs> severely steep <laughs> yeah. and the next step from here is being able to live your life in a computer <laughs> like, yeah i don't know how much we can change on that forefront of things like it's yeah. going to continue progressing no matter what that's who we are yeah we're psychos <laughs> it's crazy yeah i think yeah there's two ways to look at it just like there's probably two ways to look at anything just like Whistler, like there's, um, it's a lot of opportunity and it's a lot of room for, you know, because like a lot of, you know, you look at say the Whistler job market, there's a lot of jobs, but there's also a lot of shitty jobs, but yep. there's also a lot of opportunity and same with technology. Like I think technology has opened up jobs to everyone. Like there's so much opportunity for people on the internet kind of things, mm -hmm. but there's also an opportunity to get addicted to some gnarly stuff that you can find on the internet. And, and it's taken a lot down. of people's jobs away. Yeah, and it has taken a lot of jobs away too. It's really look at it. There's, um, I actually had someone uh, driving them down to Vancouver the other day who was a representative for McDonald's. Okay. Massive, like higher up in their company somewhere along the way, and they spoke on um, those automated ordering systems. Oh yeah. That was an attempt to reduce staff. It was, hey. Yeah. And they've actually, I think it was a massive number of like 30% of their staff has been fired or something because of those automated systems. Dude, like think about automating checkouts at grocery stores. It's faster and easier anyways. Yeah. Like I, now that I know, like now that you understand it and they work good, you're like, yeah, yeah I'd way rather go to this machine because I get out twice as fast and I value my time more than I value, you know, buddy yeah. at the desk job kind of thing. So I'm going to go through the automated checkout. Yeah. 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 It provides that, but. It's a crazy thing to start buying into. But now, like, you can do whatever you want and have a life on the internet and support yourself yeah. that way. So definitely, definitely motivates me to learn something that a computer can't take over. <laughs> yeah, things that are uh, <laughs> a little set in stone. Yeah. Even as carpenters, um, I saw a few years ago now they're 3D printing houses out of concrete. Yeah. Easier, cheaper, faster, no labor. Why not? And it won't even be like, say, They'll be like, oh, like, you know, a computer or a robot can't do this. But it's like, yeah, but you can do 50% of it. So then you'll only got 50% of the jobs and there's 50% yep. of you out. Like, it's not going to be one day they create their great robot that does it all. But yep. it's slowly going to happen where this is taken away from you. That's taken away from you. And that's, yeah. Well, I don't think as people, at least art form is hopefully something until these robots seriously have uh, yeah. perspectives Creativity. and minds of their own. And, yeah. Um, well, I guess AI is already there, but uh, to start creating their own realities. I think, and I wonder yeah. if something. I think that'll be probably something dismissed as human weakness is yeah. our our love for creativity and our love for growth and art. Yeah. Whereas um, I th think from like that kind of standpoint, as a robot, they'd be looking towards um, direct the routes. bottom line kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Direct routes towards. Yeah, success and stuff. Whereas I don't think we can ever recreate those human emotions. Something yeah. that's been very vaguely studied is our consciousness. Oh, consciousness is so tough. Yeah, why, why we're different? Yeah, why we're not like animals? Yeah, um, I think the only animal in the world that's similar to us is dolphins. And the only people who can see things and reflect upon themselves. 
Auto. You show a dolphin a mirror, they trip out. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Whereas most people get no reception. They're just like, who's that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, they don't understand. I was actually, I listened to a guy and he was talking about, he's, he studied fear and to study fear, he studied a lot of emotion. And he said that the unique things about human is, yeah, we have autotelic consciousness, which means that we have a sense of self. Yeah. And a lot of, um, yeah, pretty much as far as we know, we're the only beings really that have a sense of self. That know that when I go like, I'm picking this up, yeah. like it's me who's picking it up versus a dog is going like ball, pick up kind of thing. It doesn't yeah. know who he is kind of thing. And there's a link with that with fear is that like from a behavior standpoint, you could say like, you know, the dog sees a bear, he's afraid. Yeah. But he doesn't, because he doesn't have autotelic consciousness, he doesn't feel afraid. He's just behaviorally reacting to the bear versus yeah. us. When we see the bear, we're like, oh fuck, I'm, I'm gonna die. That's likely we why a lot of us have different reactions. We feel afraid, yeah. That's sort of the, the difference between uh, humans and, For sure. and animals and stuff like that. Yeah, is that autotelic consciousness. Oh, we're still building up to start in this chat. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Just been going? That's it, more natural that way. For sure. Yeah. I think that'd be the tough thing about arriving somewhere unless it was a interview style podcast where oh it's hello guys off. yeah begin conversation here we go yeah yeah there's not very much genuine about that no for sure but that's why i think it's so cool you've kind of taken this on to start learning about other people some yeah. celeste expressed as well is that if you are great with conversation mm -hmm. in normal ways of talking we are 50 50 representatives for how this conversation goes right yeah. if i'm not putting any effort into this and you're putting it all um it's probably going to be a pretty shitty conversation yeah. most of the time we're set up 50 50 and yeah in give and take listening and speaking in a conversation but um if you are a great conversator you could probably start to take a bit more of that effect in the ways you interest the person you're interviewing oh like kind of how you can drive the conversation and things like that yeah to provide better depth you're yeah. probably 75 80 percent responsible for you know how a conversation ends up yeah and that's what um she'd kind of taken a relearn on how things went she had a horrible interview on uh on live tv oh and celeste yeah, yeah hadn't understood why it had gone so bad yeah and went back to relearn from it and realized that she actually probably had a massive part yeah. She thought she had been doing everything she did as a listener, but realized that she actually had a, a massive chance to ch change this. I would look at it like uh, I heard this quote about coaches is that when everything goes wrong, it's all your fault. And when everything goes right, you had nothing to do with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like if it, it, yeah, if it all goes well, then yeah, it's just you, you leave it be. But if it's going bad, yeah, you have to take it all on yourself to take some accountability and, and and do it the best way you can. Yeah. yeah. I'd say that's something I took from the cafe more than anything uh, with your staff. Yeah. Is y you can't expect common sense from anyone. No. No matter how much you might possess. Yeah. One thing I've always had is a good set of common sense. Yeah. We all look at people who do things that are opposite to our views and go, how did you even <laughs> yeah, did you make that, that happen? Yeah. But, um, one of my mentors had taught me one of the most important things with dealing with your staff is you can't get mad at anyone for something you didn't specifically That's show them how to do. Yeah. If you haven't laid out every single step of idiot proof, mm -hmm. not to say anyone, like not to put anyone down, but if you hadn't laid out every step in the right order yeah. and given every piece of information and filled in every room for error, yeah. it's your fault. It's on you at the end of the it's day. It's your fault that something had gone wrong. Right. Because you hadn't covered every basis for things where it could go left or right. Yeah. And you're the leader for that reason. Yeah. That's a huge thing to take on in life is that a lot of the time you can't hold people responsible for things that they don't know. Yeah. And that they weren't fully qualified to take over. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, my job was the same way. But, <laughs> yeah. but I had to deal with that. Yeah. Um, it's a big thing with the staff, though. Yeah. Especially when people are interested. Yeah. That they want to do it. Well, it seems like just, you know, from an outside perspective, looking over, you know, all we've talked about, you definitely have had to take a lot of accountability for things throughout your life. Otherwise, I don't think things would have gone to the way they have. For sure. And that yeah. goes back to, like I was saying, like, 
people I would consider as some mentors for me mm -hmm. throughout graduation with that harsh reality of yeah you're gonna graduate and you're gonna be on your own yeah and you need to hold yourself accountable as much as we are doing for you now right and a lot of people don't get that a lot of our friends who are very well supported and are still in school yeah haven't had a chance to have a job a job is a good way to hold some accountability towards yourself because you start to understand that yeah you need to do things right you yeah can't, you can't go there and fuck around and skip a shift and expect to come back you know what i mean so that's a small level of accountability you learn but it's different when you need it though when you need to keep that job i think exactly yeah um but that's something i learned to put towards other things when you, yeah. when you need to do something you're gonna do it yeah it's the same way as um if i'd worked so hard to make it through school or you work so hard to get your job you're gonna yeah. want to keep it <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah it all comes down you drove uh, the wagon here? Yeah. Can you drop some specs for any car people listening? Um, <laughs> currently just picked up a um, Nissan 1998 Stagia RS4 edition. Yeah. Um, this was the top edition of that car you could buy at the time with four available models and then the 260 RS, which was a, um, a manufacturer's takeover and they built a special car with the RB26 uh, TT from the previous year's yeah. Skyline, but mine has the RB25 DT from an R33. Oh, is it um, swapped? No, it's the stock engine that comes in that uh, car. That's okay. why they're considered, um, kind of wrongly considered, but a, a Skyline wagon. Yeah, because whereas it it's it. the R33 GTST all-wheel drive system, so you get the same thing. Sorry, from a GTR, yeah. you get the same all-wheel drive system as a as a GTR, and you get the same engine that you get in an R32 GTR. Oh man! So I'm driving a. Uh, it's like this. It's like a baby of so many different vehicles all yeah. together. Yeah. All with enough room to sleep in the back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's considered the Skyline for a road trip. Yeah. Does it have like four wheel steer then, like the full Hikus thing? Yes. Wow. Hikus is a very interesting thing until it starts to stick and you're crab walking down the road with <laughs> yeah. your w right wheels, <laughs> your back wheels oh. and behind you. Um, luckily still working on mine. Yeah. Um, I figured it was one of those things great when it's working and then as soon as it breaks, it's just a nightmare kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's the first car since my Mitsubishi though that I've been excited to uh, to grow with a little bit do some hold on to it for a little bit do some yeah do yeah. a little bit of work to it unfortunately i see every vehicle as an investment opportunity <laughs> yeah <laughs> but um smart way to look at it though definitely gonna be a fun car yeah um the hard thing is with these japanese cars is we don't have a lot of availability for information with right. them though. Yeah. forums um a lot of the information is in another language yeah totally. on how to deal with these vehicles yeah um we don't have import parts areas here it's we don't so have uh good. import dealers like if i plug my car into a, a diagnostics reader it, it doesn't even rec i might as well have plugged it into a potato like it, obd2 means nothing to it means nothing to it it oh, does not even shit. recognize that this is a vehicle because it's technically trying to talk to the code reader in japanese <laughs> yeah <laughs> they doesn't speak it yeah it's got no idea what's going on yeah um so that's a learning opportunity all in itself actually probably the most i ever learned about cars was from my mitsubishi evo um breaking on me once a week <laughs> yeah was it imported or it was uh, yes uh, uh, okay. i really hand drive imported evo 4 um and when i had bought it it had been modded up to about 360 horsepower Wow. It's the fastest car I've ever been in, let alone owned. Yeah. Um, and luckily I had a, a good friend uh, at an import shop who was able to help That's me through right. a lot of the issues. Um, but even from a professional standpoint, it was weeks sometimes for small misfires and wow. little things because those diagnostic readers were made for a reason. Yeah. So you weren't just tearing shit apart, switching just parts. Guessing. yeah. Uh, and with a lot of Japanese cars, that's your best bet if you have a donor car. Mm -hmm. If this isn't working, try that one. Put it in. Oh, Hopefully it up, fixes eh? the problem. Yeah. Like swap parts out. And it's hope. just a guessing game. A lot point. of the time it's a guessing game. Like as a mechanic, you're kind of like a nutritionist. You're guessing towards mm -hmm. what the problem might be a lot of the time. I, there's some hilarious thing of a, it was a quote on a shirt on what mechanics do. Where we're like well-educated people making um, loosely educated guesses <laughs> towards <laughs> what might be going on kind of thing yeah well it's not this so maybe it's that oh it's not that maybe it's this you just yeah keep going around in circles. um it's an interesting thing to go through and it's a really cool learning process as yeah. well yeah the cars that break the most teach you the most like they're kind of from that you gotta enjoy them though yeah get the, get out of my <laughs> yeah. get out of my life yeah um 
well, especially if you need to rely on it to get to work, something yeah. like that, and it's breaking on you every yeah. week. Yeah, that's something that changed for me actually. Once I had kind of gotten away from high school and realized how much cars can cost you, like I said, this oh, before right. moving to Whistler, yeah. dropping almost four thousand dollars on a clutch and a couple of things on my yeah. Audi before I got out here. Yeah. Whereas in high school, I've always had a weird relationship with cars that. I figured they should be enjoyable as well. It's one yeah. of those things, just like work, you spend so much of your day driving. For me, I'll spend at least an hour in my car every day. Might just as well. Like going it. to from work, might as well enjoy A to B. Everyone's always told me my whole life, you just need to get from A to B. Yeah. Why not enjoy it? Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> when I was young, it was enjoyment was put well above making it A to yeah. B. Yeah. <laughs> like I'd rather have a good time from here to halfway to where i'm going a to b plus kind of thing yeah and then walk the rest of the um way. and then yeah i walked the rest of the way and had a good time till there kind of thing yeah whereas i've slowly had to learn to get somewhere in the middle yeah yeah a uh, moderate amount enjoy the a to b but still still make it <laughs> yeah live moderately fast and get most places kind of thing. yeah um i had a good friend who always had this good saying um with his car it was always causing him troubles yeah best car in the world starts every time most of the time <laughs> <laughs> yeah it works 60 percent of the time all the time yeah yeah and cars are a funny relationship and it's a funny thing that yeah. uh, especially a lot of women i've had in my life do not understand oh no idea why you would have anything like that yeah yeah it's yeah. <laughs> it's like why would you deal with so much yeah. uh, struggle and so much money and so much investment for a little turbo noise on all you can be like well it's because i like it yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's one of those things hard to explain why we have yeah. uh, this weird connection mainly as dudes yeah like not to be specific at all but it's one of those things that we're predisposed to like quite it's a bit more genetic as, yeah. as men that we, we, like we enjoy engines yeah things and yeah things and they like personal relationships it's and genetic didn't realize there's an actual uh connection uh, all people have with velocity Okay. Something that changes with that same uh, receptor used in your eardrum when you spin, yeah. that you understand um, your your weight and your um, gravity and stuff upon you. Yeah, that, that's a feeling of enjoyment. Actually, is actually being you get some a feeling of acceleration. Release. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I surely like it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, don't we all? Yeah, um, it's something I could see myself getting into to add to my little repertoire of careers one day. Yeah, cars are fun. I think cars are super fun. When I look at it, like cars are something that it would be so fun to like you know have your own projects yeah. but being a mechanic seems like the shittiest job ever i think it would want to be very specific with it you i have a friend who like, only builds turbos yeah great job yeah no like very rarely are you working on a lame car yeah like sure there's a lot of uh, new cars that use turbos for economy but right. anything yeah, older yeah. than like 2004 there was no turbos on cars that were meant for economy because turbo technology was so bad yeah for cooling them um like the reason i have to run my car for 30 seconds before i turn it off yeah um for for cooling for maintenance of the turbos like you'll go through a turbo every 50,000 kilometers on like an old car right um but now with the technology of how good they are yeah they're much better not on exciting cars yeah but well that's yeah like you, you said, find your niche in every industry yeah um, but i've definitely found that i've got a lot of good friends who are mechanics and um i've been grateful enough with cooking that it's not one of those jobs that if you do it all day long it's the last thing you want to do when you get home you know right. mo most mechanics don't drive nice cars yeah a hundred percent yeah like yeah. most of them don't want to work on cars when they get home yeah they're over it they've worked all day exactly yeah um don't make very much money so it's, yeah. if there is something you love Probably one of the worst things you can do is overexpose yourself to a negative aspect of it. Yeah, you're doing the shittiest part of it, which is doing all like the the basic maintenance on the on the people's cars who they just like to go A to B, and they exactly. don't care what the thing looks like by the end. And then you gotta fix it to get them back from B to A kind of thing. Something I've taken a lot from uh, a personal trainer I'm working with. Yeah. They figure it's some of the most demotivating work in the world when you have clients who don't who just want to spend the money and expect things to change. Right, yeah. Uh, it's hard on your lifestyle afterwards. It's hard on your lifestyle. You put yeah. so much effort into these people and so much motivation and so much of your energy goes towards them if you don't get any of that reciprocated. Yeah. People show up, hey, did you do your workouts this week? Because most people can't afford to go every single day or every right. time they go into the gym. Yeah. Did you do your workouts this week? No, this is my first one since last week. Yeah. How do you expect anything to change? Yeah. 
Like now you're all out of cricket again. We got to do an hour of stretching together before you can even do your workout. <laughs> you know 100%. what I mean? If, if people don't take that validation into their own life, it can be really tough on you as a job. Well, there's something I think to be said about honing your skills, you know, kind of how you were talking about, you don't want to get the, you don't want to eat the dinner of the dishwasher kind of thing. Yeah. And that's, that's probably to be said of like, like I have a buddy who works on cars and he's like, I think I'm getting to the point where I can do other people's passion projects. Yeah. So he's got such a, a niche set of skills that now he's working on the really cool builds. Exactly. So honing your skills, yeah, before you go into businesses like that, so you can take in the top client. client For sure. Career. Yeah, you're always working with people who have that kind of experience. And start to deal with that aspect of yeah. choosing your route. Yeah. I think maybe a lot of people get confused along that as well, is where they choose to go in their industry. A lot of people fall in love with something mm-hmm. and fall into the wrong side of what they're doing. Yeah. It's hard to find that right pursuit. It's a lot of traps right for sure. track. Yeah. For sure. We've got so many traps nowadays. Yeah. Especially in Whistler. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think more than just about anywhere. Yeah. Well, it's crazy to see how, how different people with the same opportunity will choose to live their life here. Yeah, I agree. There's a lot of us who go drink every single night. Mm-hmm. I don't understand how they get up in the morning, but yeah, um, in the same place with the same opportunities that people have such different perspectives on. Right. Whereas a lot of people feel like it's impossible to get ahead here. It's impossible yeah. uh, to learn anything here. And yeah, my perspective is the exact opposite. Yeah. Is I feel like this is one of the easiest places or one of the only places I should say that you can get ahead while living the exact lifestyle you want to. Wow. Like there's not many other places that offer so much availability of stuff you love like right. f- for us being a passion for snowboarding yeah. recently for mountain biking dirt biking the outdoors here so all of our friends who have a similar mindset with that stuff outside makes it even better we're all able to do stuff communally yeah. um but it i, I kind of got lost there <laughs> i i see it i mean i think out of you know that's why i definitely have to i don't know like applaud you or like you know i, I definitely <laughs> It's, it's really cool to see because I think I've heard that so much about how it's really difficult to make it here and you see people I mean I struggle so much and I have so much support kind of thing but you know you're someone who's come in without that kind of support and really made it happen mm-hmm. there is that room yeah. for all aspects here yeah. room for learning like I was saying about um, getting jobs that you're not qualified for just yeah. with the right head on your shoulders and the openness to learning and then so do you, do you think it is like just a mindset thing um there's a lot of things on that aspect that there's a lot of things that I have great advice for that I don't do <laughs> and a lot of things that I'm great at that I have no advice for. I know what you mean. Okay, yeah, so you can say that you've you've done well, I bet you couldn't put it into words kind of thing. I have to just say your openness to to finishing what your initial goal was. Okay. first of all something that has been really important to me yeah. that was one of the biggest things I learned from my mother is that growing up without a lot of money and if you want to do something yeah. and I'm spending the money for you to do this sport I don't care if you don't like it halfway through the season yeah. you know finish <laughs> finish what you started right um, so if you gain a job with a goal mm-hmm. or you have an aspiration to try something new yeah. get to where you want it to be yeah. before you quit it and that's why I feel like I've acquired all these little skills that I'm not going to pursue to end my life with. Yeah. But it's why I got to a point where I have an understanding of something before you move on. Yeah. So if you go halfway through any job you're doing, quit halfway, don't stick with the knowledge, that's technically lost time. Yeah. Whereas if you finish it, even if you didn't like it, you finish what you were doing. It doesn't mean, like I was saying before, with cooking where you decide you're going to be a head chef, own a restaurant, and then... 40 years later, take your step back. Like, yeah. just get to a point where you know how to do something a little bit better, yeah. where you've learned something. Be prepared to be amazed at right. what you're ready to learn. Um, probably say that's the first most important step. That's... And secondly, being available to challenge yourself. Yeah. Like, I, when I first got to Whistler, did job interviews kind of selfishly just yeah. to practice. Okay. I handed out like 30 resumes one day yeah. and lined up job interviews for like two weeks for jobs I didn't want because yeah. I knew how important of a skill it was here in Whistler yeah. to be able to go through a good interview. 
Wow. Because it's scary when you get a good interviewer. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't know what to say. Right. It's a freaky place to be. to build that skill. Yeah. Um, I was definitely interested in a lot of decisions. Yeah. But I'd say that's something that's important as well, being open, open to that and try new things as well. It's really fascinating you say all that stuff. I, um, during like about a couple months ago during summer camp, I, I read this, well, I listened to this book. It's called Grit. Yeah. It's by this girl, Ashley Duckworth. And you pretty much recited it like the start of a chapter. And it was talking about, she studied a lot of people, like um, studied some Navy SEALs going through BUDS and stuff like that, and, and a bunch of other different academic and uh, sports pursuits, like physical pursuits. And when she traced them back to high school, the kids who stayed in a extracurricular activity for more than two years, mm-hmm. like stuck it out through the season, that predicted their success more, success more than pretty much very few other metrics. And what that's calculating is essentially your grit, your ability to stick through Mm -hmm. something that's difficult and be willing to take criticism and learn and stuff like that. Yeah, taking criticism as well. God damn, I could never do it. Oh yeah? For like years of my life. That's where the self-pity comes into play. Someone gives you some criticism. You're like, yeah, well, just fuck me. How yeah. about this? <laughs> yeah. Easiest way to get out of things. Yeah. Yeah, Easiest yeah. way to fucking take things on your own. Yeah. Um, and for some reason, it doesn't have a, a massive visual negative effect on your life. You don't see it right then. You don't see it right then until you look back and go, why did I waste all that time thinking I was horrible at this one? I could have just been practicing getting better. Right. Yeah. Like with a lot of things I'm trying to do more recently, I can't read. Okay. I sit down for like three minutes. I go crazy. Yeah. It's tough. My eyes start spinning. My mind starts wandering. Yeah. I can't write very well. Okay. I I used to write um, great on things I was interested in in school, like essays and whatnot. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, But for it to come free flowing, Mm -hmm. almost impossible. Yeah. Um, Once again, like with conversational competency. Yeah. It's something I was never great at. It's so difficult. And reading is one of the biggest aspects to learning that just just growing your vocabulary um that's wow. where i find to get caught a lot of the time is that i feel like i'm pretty good at expressing myself a lot of the time miss the word yeah and then can't figure out another way to explain that feeling yeah something i think english might be lacking a little bit on yeah There's a lot of other languages that have words to describe feelings yeah we have to like really lay it out there build a whole sentence to describe one thing really lay it out there um but learn like but would you say now that you uh, have some more experience with going through more difficult things that you look at those um, challenges not as like a negative, like, oh, I suck at this, but more as like a, this is something I can get better at kind of thing? I try to. Yeah. It's the toughest thing in the world, though. Yeah, I agree. It's so so difficult to look at something like, wow, I really suck at this. But Especially for people like us who are athletes. Yeah. M- most of our friend group is pretty good at everything they try right yeah natural the natural talent yourself as well like you pick up a ball for the first time you can toss it around right like just little physicality skills like that have for myself personally like i've most physical pursuits i've tried i've been able to become proficient in something that i put my time into whereas things like music and whatnot like yeah i've shied away from them because i've picked up a guitar before and i was like holy shit yeah <laughs> this is tough yeah uh and i'm like i'm gonna keep doing what i'm good at over here that's why i'm almost i'm starting to have this weird thing with talent where i think sometimes having the most talent is a bigger detriment like you're i think you're almost better off to suck enough that you <laughs> yeah. always have to be dealing with criticism and dealing with working through things because you may the guy with the talent may right off the bat shoot up, yeah. But I, I just don't think the lasting skill is that ability to, to keep working. And like you were forward. saying with the Sunday, like they might just go to the cherry store and get yeah half of the cherries in the store, but they've got no base to throw them on. And they get sick of it, and then that's it, and they're done. Yeah, everything. yeah. No, there is. There's a Joe Rogan quote, or actually I don't know who's quote this is, but there's a benefit to doing things that are hard. And that's where discipline comes from. Yeah. Unfortunately, like most of the very interesting people I've met in my life mm-hmm. had massive adversity to overcome. Yeah. Whether it was through their childhood, the way they grew up, through adoption, um, like loss of people close to them. Most people learn from adversity. Yeah. 
that's one of the toughest things I think of when you were talking about if my relationship with my parents has changed anything about yeah. the way I think. It's when I have kids, obviously, I grew up a little bit fucked up, yeah. and I don't want them to have that same yeah. same reality. But I'm so grateful for who it's made me. Right. And you kind of need to balance those aspects. Like you can't just throw your kids on the streets and expect them to start learning. Yeah. But you need to introduce them to adversity and and uh, to hardship in in whether it's through a comfortable environment. Yeah. People need to learn what it's like to lose. Yeah. People need to learn what it's There's like value uh, in it. for sure. Yeah. Um, whether it's through sport, uh, without participation <laughs> trophies. Yeah. Martial arts is a cool aspect of that because. Um, you know, you know when you lost. <laughs> throwing your tap is technically <laughs> admission to life. Like, yeah, this person could have taken your life in that case. Yeah. Um, but something really interesting when you think about how you'd like to parent your children. Obviously, everyone would like to put them in this ideal space. Yeah. Um, but that's how you end up on Doctor Phil. You could be doing. You get everything you want. <laughs> yeah, it's like you wouldn't wish adversity on anyone, but you're kind of grateful if they have it. For and sure. You get through it, you know. Like you don't want to see people struggle or suffer. And you don't want to go through it yourself. But at the end of the day, you know that that's gonna what's gonna get you to where you need to go. Unfortunately, suffering is great for the human condition. <laughs> yeah, it's a necessary thing. In the same way, like if something's really meaningful to you, yeah. it's gonna create more drive out of that effect. Yeah. If something if you seriously lost something when you're growing up. Yeah. It's really gonna motivate you. For sure. In that aspect. Yeah. Yeah, it's balanced. Suffering with, without hope is, is is sad to see. But yeah, if you can see that light forward and, and use that to work towards something greater, I think those skills that you learn through all that stuff is going to be really beneficial. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for you know sharing so much of your story with me. I really appreciate it. No worries. It's I find it, uh, I found this one specifically interesting because I actually don't think we talked about a lot that we know about each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's cool though. It yeah. makes it a, a little easier to chat. Yeah, um, that's what I found weird with doing interviews and stuff. So when you when you know someone, it's hard to ask those all oh, those those questions, generic questions. Yeah, um, I guess in a bigger platform, you can ask questions for your listeners. But yeah, um, it's nice to have a conversation and actually dig into some new shit. Yeah, it is cool. That's you know, like selfishly, just having my friends on here is just cool. It's because I get to learn so much about it. For sure. Yeah, of course. I was actually really impressed listening to uh, Marco's chat. Marcos is really insightful for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, much more than a lot of people I think would expect. Yeah, I thought that was really cool. That's one thing I've been lucky that I've noticed after this is I feel like more people are kind of open to talk after yeah. they listen to you talk. Like I've said, gotten into more deeper conversations with more people since doing this. For and sure, it's one thing that I'm super stoked about for sure. And do you know to take that outside as well? Yeah, into other avenues. Yeah, yeah. like she says use uh the skills i use a professional interviewer and in natural conversation yeah <laughs> works yeah. well <laughs> works well sick kid. Anyway, thanks awesome. Zog. thank you man appreciate it done did it dude done did it